Mm. And that makes the trio for our panel now. So um, if I could invite now uh, Professor Giulio Licino, who is going to uh, lead that discussion. He, of course, you met him yesterday, the Deputy Director for Translational Medicine and Head of the Mind and Brain Theme at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Centre. Thank you very much indeed. And also joining us again, Professor Holmes and Professor Maya Lindenberg. And hopefully we'll get some of your questions at the end. Thank you. Hi, it um, was really wonderful to uh, be able to be part of this session uh, as chair and to see these wonderful presentations. I, um, one thing that I think is very clear that even though there is a lot of uh, controversy as to what's a disorder, what's really um, true or not true in psychiatry, I don't think anybody would disagree that psychiatric disorders are common and complex disorders of gene environmental interactions. And you saw in the morning the um, very elaborate search for genes, which is obviously it's a complex <laughs> genetic pattern, so it's not simple. And that complexity was presented by Steve Hyman in the morning. But I think what's very often missed is the environmental component, which was so elegantly presented by uh, Emily Holmes and by um, Professor Maya Lindenberg uh, just now. So maybe we could begin uh, the discussion on the impact of the environment. And another comment I'd like to make is that uh, at the end of his presentation, Steve Hyman mentioned that uh, a problem with psychiatry is that we use 1950s treatment in the 21st century. But I think what uh, Helen uh, presented so elegantly is that we can use 21st <laughs> treatments in the 21st century. So um, I think it's really a, a step forward. And uh, we typically, in psychiatry, approach treatment in a way that's very non-standardized, but we end up with people who don't respond uh, very well to existing uh, therapies and they are called refractory and in schizophrenia there are different approaches, but there is like a residual uh, but substantially large number of people who don't respond to anything in either uh, the more the psychotic disorders or in the mood disorders. And then we really need to do something that's conceptually different and more intensive and more aggressive to address those problems. And the ability to uh, develop a circuitry map for depression I think gives um, unparalleled new opportunities for, for us to go you know, straight at the root of the problem, so to speak. So uh, maybe we could begin the discussion about the impact of the environment and then uh, rapidly go towards a new approach to treatment that Helen presented so elegantly. So in terms of the environment, I was uh, fascinated by uh, your work about um, the impact of living in cities. Do you think that... Um, is that like a generational effect? In other words, if a family has been in a city for like, you know, several generations and there hasn't been this, because I, I understand that the transition from a rural environment to an urban environment is very stressful by itself. But do you think it's more the impact of that transition or if some, you know, someone has been in the city for several generations, you still have that impact? Does it make a difference? That, that's a very good question. I'm not sure that there are uh, good data on that. Uh, we know from epidemiological work that the city risk uh, with regard to schizophrenia is around birth and early childhood, so you take it with you if you move to the country afterwards, whereas the risk uh, for depression, anxiety has to change at some point when you move, uh, and it's probably superimposed, as you say, with the transition risk. Mm -hmm. The reason people really don't know how the dynamics of that is, is that traditional epidemiological research in which you essentially count cases or ask people about the symptoms is very uh, poorly grained. You have all or nothing uh, data, so you need huge numbers to disentangle these kinds of lifestyle uh, effects. So one of the hopes that we're having is that with the imaging measure, which you can easily derive in someone who's otherwise healthy, we can have a more sensitive idea of how quickly after you move to the country does the risk normalize? Or uh, another example where this is currently very interesting is the second highest risk after city uh, birth is migration. So if you're a member of an ethnic minority, and we are currently looking in Germany at this large influx of refugees, which is a really interesting quasi-experiment that just arrived. And so we are trying to see a little bit what the dynamics of that change is. But with traditional epidemiological work, it's hard to get that kind of information which is, however, vital to inform prevention. Okay. And I had one question for Emily about uh, your amazing work trying to stop the consolidation of traumatic uh, memories. 
with the um, kind of difficult birth, you have a captive population because the mother is right there in yeah. the maternity ward and you can do your intervention and you know when the birth is happening. So um, how do you think it, that it's possible to translate that to other more um, kind of, um, to other types of trauma that the onset you don't have so much control over? like car accidents or other types yeah, of acute yeah. traumatic events that you cannot be there like right when the thing is happening? That's a great question. So, I mean, not all births are traumatic. So th mm. these are only the ones where, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it is. But actually, I'm very optimistic. So if the purpose of this conference is to be visionary, if people have a car accident, uh, the average time in America to get to A&E is about half an hour, 20 minutes. So there are places that people go after trauma. So one option is to go to places like the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Another option is to think about differently about the way we deliver our therapies because there's a behavioral procedure that one would need to follow. What if we could combine things so we could actually work together, for example, with technology to make this available in the sense of a disaster? So we could think about disaster planning in a different way, whether that's earthquakes, whether that's war, terrorism, and think about how we would make evidence-based treatments or brain-informed treatments available in a way that people could be the downloader themselves of information. So I don't know, but I would love to work with people on solving those kind of mm -hmm. technological problems and opportunities. Okay. All right. And maybe we can um, have some comments from Helen about... Um, how maybe uh, DBT can be combined with other types of like, you know, experimental or innovative treatments? So one of the things that's been interesting about this experiment in following, you know, patients now for over 10 years is how to see how they emerge to be able to go back to actually be retrained with cognitive therapy and that the, there is a biology of the recovery phase. So now that I think we're able to segregate this acute effect that really may need to be optimized in the operating room, mm. that then the chronic component, it actually, unlike what you're describing, mm. after people have been chronically ill, it takes several months of you know six to eight weeks to where then yeah. the therapist is able to initiate true CBT. Yeah. And that the patients themselves will describe that they actually don't have access to their mental machinery yet to actually do the exercises. So understanding the nature of emotional bandwidth, how do we train it? Understanding what is plasticity? Is it activity dependent plasticity? Does the stimulation itself rebuild up the white matter that allows you to do the exercises? But there's a very consistent process that they are not able to do it until something big question mark happens. And I think it, it brings to bear this idea that one size does not fit all for treatment, that we need the tools of technology to help us segregate, whether it's the brain can help us to identify the genes, the genes can help to identify the brain, the, the interaction, because once we have the state of the brain or the state of a network, which can be in different states, you may actually need to initiate a first treatment in order to be sensitive to the second. And so the order of treatments may be as important as what the brain state is that you're treating. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take all the time and we, the session should be finishing very soon. So I'd like to uh, ask the audience if people have questions should uh, come if there's like a quick question. Really that's pressing, yes. Talk to you. There's two questions immediately. Gentleman in the front row here, and then we'll come to you in a second. Thank you. What time do we have? Hi, I'm Dr. Barghouti from Palestine. I, you've shown that the urbanization has a very clear effect in the prevalence of mental disorders. I was wondering, and you've shown also that people who are born in urban areas are more uh, uh, have higher possibility of having the diseases. Did you do any studies about communities who are in transition? We, we noticed that in many developing countries, the communities that are living through a process of urbanization are actually passing through a transitional period. Did you do any studies on that? And do you find it interesting to, to investigate? 
Um, you're asking me, right? So, so uh, we are doing studies in rapidly urbanizing areas of uh, China and India, uh, looking, however, at you know that method carrying smartphones, seeing what people's mood and cognition and so on is in those cities. The basic studies that the risk is increased hasn't been done by us. That's a very large literature that goes back to the 30s of the preceding centuries. And those studies have been done uh, around the world. A lot of it has been done in stably urbanized areas uh, in, in Europe, but there have been examples on there in cities that are very rapidly urbanizing at the time of the study. For Sao Paulo is one example that at the time was actually, I think, the most rapidly urbanizing uh, place on earth. So that seems to accrue to that also. Whether maybe that's the background of your question, there's an additional risk increase or the dynamic in the risk that has been induced by the rapid urbanization is a really interesting question. It's going to be very relevant, especially for developing countries. So one bit that we're currently doing is trying to figure out does using our methods, the processing of social stress change. However, our studies are not really able to tell you what's going to be the incidence of schizophrenia 10 years from then. For that, you have to follow mm -hmm. that up. But it, it forms, uh, uh, I think there's increasing interest also in that whole idea of smart cities, that as a lot of data is being produced in cities and used to steer cities, a lot of that data will also be useful if you combine it with the mobile devices that we have to measure how people are doing and to come back to the point that Emily just had to deliver treatments. We now mm. know that various psychotherapies can be delivered on smartphones in a way that isn't measurably worse, that is non-inferior to doing a face-to-face -face transaction. If you combine these two yeah. strands, you may have a very powerful way to deliver treatments. Uh, we actually now are uh, in the process of, uh, of starting a study uh, in, in the West Bank uh, using exactly that kind of method to deliver PTSD treatments to population that we simply cannot otherwise reach because they're inaccessible for, for uh, political reasons. Very interesting. Thank you so much. The lady here, and then we'll come to the gentleman on the end. Samira Islam, Saudi Arabia. I'd like to ask uh, the memory and stress and psychological. Uh, if you like to consider uh, people with a postpartum depression, uh, those people, why not all women who deliver get depressed? and the uh, endorphins and encephalins and the uh, uh, neurological markers in the body. I was worrying about this. This I can't think I would like to question is that I like you this session particularly because it really applies to human. While you have a lot of experimental animals and we try to, while in between the human, we still have a lot of variabilities and people who react and some people who commit suicide, all from drugs. I feel one of the main cause of all these depressions relates back to drugs and the combination of the, uh, let's say, like, uh, uh, like the Prozac and like the cocaine. And when they combine to the tissue of the brain, there is a <coughs> binding that may last and will continue like a snowball. I'm sorry, but I, there's a lot of interesting subject, but I have to cut it short. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Could make one, one comment about that, which I think is a huge problem in psychiatry that's not addressed at all is that um, I used to be head of a clinical pharmacology, and one thing that's very um, kind of forgotten when people uh, prescribe drugs is that each drug is studied separately. So like if you have a new target and come up with a new drug and a new you know, intervention, you put that, uh, you find uh, people who have a disease and only that disease, and you give that drug, and then you do this phase two, phase three, even phase four trials. And you see the effects of that one drug, and then the you know the FDA or the equivalent European agency then approves or doesn't approve. But if it's approved, then it goes to the market. But that drug was tested in isolation, both in animals and in humans. And um, a colleague of mine, when I was at UCLA, did just like a survey. She's the head of the outpatient geriatric psychiatry clinic, and she did a survey of how many different drugs the patients were on. And each patient was on average on 14 different drugs. 
And the combination of drugs is not tested, not even in an animal. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't give three drugs to a rat to see what happens, but you give the three drugs to the human. And then if you think about drug-drug interaction, drug metabolism, drug metabolizing enzymes, some enzymes are induced by some drugs, and then the metabolism of the others is accelerated. Some enzymes are like, you know, uh, kind of occupied by one drug, and then the metabolism of the others is, goes the opposite direction. So the immense kind of a pharmacokinetic and potential even a pharmacodynamic interactions that may happen as a result of combination of drugs is something that's not commented, not discussed, not studied. And in the reality, that's what most people are on. And what we deal with is individual drugs, and which is very seldom the reality of clinical care. Just um, to comment on that is that in these very resistant patients that I study, I always used to think that there would be a prototype that kind of identified people before they had to fail so many treatments. And the sobering reality is that these are people who actually responded to early illnesses just like everyone else. There is a malignant transformation. They've had repeated episodes. And the, the thought question for the animal models people is, don't build a model of an illness and break it once and tell us what happens. Build a model, fix it, break it again and see what happens with subsequent episodes even in an animal model because while the treatments, we do the best we can um, and I'm not advocating that the, the medications them help themselves are hurting the brain, but they're clearly not curing it and the adaptation to medications may be part of what makes someone at risk for subsequent um, problems. So I think we have to try to study the complexity, whether it's at the visual cortex or it's with these drugs. Okay, do you want to contribute to that answer as well? Two really short points, I, I, um, and I'm sure we could discuss longer. One is that you're right, not everybody gets ill after a stress or a trauma, and the great challenge for science is for us to understand resilience as well as dysfunction. And I think the second thing is I do think behavioral treatments have a wonderful role to play in the future because they map onto neurocircuitry or they may fit with social environments or they may be combined with medications. But I think what Julio, Andreas and Helen and I might all agree on is that we need many approaches and to work together to devise more intelligent treatment strategies. Thank you very much. In the interest of trying, because we already are overrunning, um, I did promise this gentleman here that he could ask a question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Basim Uthman, neurologist from Wild Cornell Medicine in Doha, Qatar. About 80% of the population in Qatar is expatriate. And there's a new um, movement, if you may, uh, the uh, uh, third culture kids. Hmm. Um, are there any risks for mental illnesses in the third culture kids? One of the most distressing things or question you can ask those people is that where are you from? And they don't know where they're from. Mm. Thank you. One, one of the fascinating things about migration is if you are a first generation migrant, your risk to have schizophrenia is about 270% of normal, right? It's not quite as much the tripling that you get in, uh, in the urban born. The children of these first generation migrants who haven't had the transition of migration and who have all their life lived uh, in the host country have a risk that is probably higher and approach 300%. So uh, that uh, is uh, emerging from meta-analysis, a very subtle effect. Yeah. We know for sure that the risk in the children is not lower, and many of us start to think, of oh, the risk is actually higher. And that may have to do with the discrepancy between how your family functions as a consequence of the culture that the parents come from and the host country and or it may also be a transgenerational epigenetic effect, which is also a very interesting real possibility that your family's history impacts your cellular programming through epigenetics. There's numerous examples mm. of that now, and that might be another one. These two very intriguing possibilities are currently being examined, and I would assume, although I don't know the specifics of Qatar, that that might have a bearing on that kind of families. And, and situations. I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump in and bring this panel session to a close. I 
feel that we could probably use up all of our remaining time on this subject. So thank you all very much indeed for highlighting the kind of unparalleled new opportunities available in this field and, and also raising such important issues, um, not only about patients, but also how society is affected. So a big round of applause, please, for our panel. Thank you. <laughs>